Okay, uh, I'd like to greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> uh, it's good to see you all today. Uh, it's another chilly day, so to speak, but uh, not really. So um, let us uh, open up uh, our Bibles today and uh, let's see what the Lord has for us. Uh, it's, it's always very exciting to see what the Lord will teach us each week and um, let, us, let us take heed to that today. So uh, today I'd like for us to look at a topic called a convenient God, a convenient God. And, um, you know, to be honest, uh, this, this is, uh, uh, you know, judging from the topic, you probably have some assumptions about what I'll be talking about. And uh, I'm not sure if you'll be right or wrong in the assumptions you'll make. Um, but this is a very sensitive uh, issue, especially here in Swaziland because uh, people tend to worship a convenient God. Uh, of course, it's a worldwide issue, but there's a, there's a specific way in which we do it here in this nation, which is not right. Uh, of, of course, there's the potential of me being persecuted for some of the things I'll say today, especially because it will be available online. Don't know who's going to see it. But uh, the truth is the truth. And I need to proclaim it uh, exactly the way the Bible presents it. There's no other way. There's no other way I can preach. The things we say here don't come from any headquarters somewhere. Uh, they come from the word of God. And this is the only thing we can preach. Okay, a convenient God. Uh, the first thing that we need to realize, once again, this is something that we, we often forget um, in general, is that we were created for God. God wasn't created for us. We were created for Him. We were created by Him. So therefore, our purpose here on earth is not about us, us, us. It's about God. He created us. He, he owns us. Which means that He can destroy us at any moment if He chooses to. He, he, we were created for Him. So therefore, the reason why I had to mention that is there's something we need to get clear. Your purpose and God's purpose. We need to get it clear that God doesn't exist to please you and make you happy all the time and just give you all the things you want. That's not why God exists. Yeah, God doesn't exist to just be waiting to hear from you as you give him orders on what to do in your life. We exist for God. We need to hear from him. We need to receive what he gives us, and we, we need to thank him for that. And even when he takes things away, we need to trust him even with that. But we, should, we need to keep that in mind, even when looking at this topic of a convenient God, is that God doesn't exist for us. We exist for him, or at least we're supposed to. We're supposed to exist for Him. Our purpose is supposed to be that we bring glory and honor to Him at all times. And, and here, here, here's another thing. As I mentioned earlier, God doesn't exist to just, you know, be always pleasing us and making us happy. Of course, there is joy when you're in the Lord. But however, we are the ones that are supposed to be making God happy, not the other way around. If you look at the Psalms, Look at how David oftentimes would say, bless ye the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Nowadays, people are always looking at, oh, how, how am I blessed? Oh, I'm so blessed. Oh, look at what I have, hashtag blessed. Oh, look at this, blessed. Oh, I'm so blessed. Oh, Lord, please bless me. It's not about us. We ought to be blessing the Lord. David said that many times, bless ye the Lord. That word bless means happy. To be blessed means to be made happy. When, when, when David says, bless ye the Lord, he's saying, make the Lord happy. How often do you think of that? How often do you think, how can I make God happy today? Or are we always just thinking, oh, uh, God, you need to make me happy today. Well, are you worshipping a convenient God? People only want a convenient God. And what I mean by worshipping a convenient God is you're only worshipping a God that is convenient to you. And there are many ways in which people have created, by the way, this is an idol. 
This is an idol. It's a small g God. Because if you've made this God, this convenient God for yourselves, you just know immediately that it's not the almighty God. You are worshipping an idol. So, how, how do people worship, or rather, how do people have a convenient God? Well, people want a God that they can worship uh, when it's convenient for them. You know, a God that you, you, you'll pick a convenient time when you will worship him and praise him. For example, most of the, most of the time when you approach people who are young, They'll tell you that, ah, no, you know, I, I've thought about this. I, I've, I've met some guys that said this as well on a Friday in town when most of the students are out back when schools were open. And, and they would say that, oh, no, you know, we've thought about this, uh, you know, salvation thing. We've thought about this being born again thing. But, you know, right now, the place we are in our lives, we just, we're just not ready for that yet. Well, one of them was even honest enough to say that, you know what, the reason why I can't take this seriously is because I know that I won't commit myself to it. I appreciate that guy's honesty. But I try to remind him that, you know, do you, do you realize how you're putting your soul in danger by not being committed to these things? But people do have that mentality that, oh, I'm still too young. I need to live life. I need to experience all these things. I need to enjoy myself before I can come to worship God. They worship, they want a convenient God who will just wait for them to enjoy their life. And really what they mean by that is I want to enjoy my sins. And then God must just wait for me. God must be convenient enough to wait for me to experience all the sins on earth. And then I'll come to worship him. Let's turn our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. In Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 9, the Bible says, this is Solomon writing, and uh, he addresses this exact issue. He says in verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. So that's what Solomon had to say in verse 9. He's, he's talking to the young man, he's, he's, he, as he says there at the beginning, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. And he's saying, you can live this way that you desire to live, just fulfilling the desires of your heart and, and the things of thine eyes. And you can just cheer yourself and just enjoy life, as they say. But know this, that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. God, God is, is not going to be that convenient God that you expect to just, you know, wait for you to live your whole life that you don't even know that you have. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. And, 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 and when, when you die sooner than you expected, you're not going to stand before God and say, Oh God, I, I would have gotten saved if you had given me more time. I was still too young. God will bring thee into judgment. And uh, Jesus Christ said it as well uh, in uh, John chapter 4. Let's turn there because we'll read uh, two verses there. But the first one that I'd like for us to read is in John chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus, when speaking to the woman of Samaria, said, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. This is what the Lord is seeking for. These are the type of people that the Lord is seeking for. The Lord is seeking for those that will worship him now. Jesus says to the woman of Samaria, uh, he says there that the hour cometh and now is. Now is the time when the true worshippers will worship the Father. How? In spirit and in truth. And he says that the Father seeketh such to worship him. 
God is not going to be convenient enough for you to worship Him at your time. God is looking for people who will worship Him now. So in what other way do people uh, worship a convenient God? Well, people like to worship God in a way that is convenient for them. So first of all, people worship God when it's convenient for them. But then also people worship God in a way that is convenient for them. Remember, we just read in verse 20, uh, in John chapter 4, verse 23, but even verse 24 says it. Verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God has a specific time, which is now, which true worshipers should worship him, but he also has a specific way in which he expects people to worship him. And that way is in the word of God. You can't just worship God in whichever way you want to worship Him. In a way that's convenient for you. That, oh no, this is how I worship God. This is how I want to do things. Well, God will not accept that. You know, uh, there there are people who uh, try to worship God with their flesh. I don't know if you've heard of that. But there are a lot of people who believe that the things that they do with their flesh are ways of worshipping God. I'll, I'll make examples with things like dancing. Certain types of, of dancing. You cannot say that, you are, that though those dance moves that you're doing are worshipping God. No, they're not. That's not a way of worshipping God. Let, let, let's start by looking at it just logically speaking. How can you think that a dance move, and and, and this is where it gets crazy. Uh, I know people defend this by saying, you know, there are people in the Bible that dance and all of that. And and even that we can look into much further, but because of time we won't. But I'll just start by saying that if if dancing in, in a church setting is okay, who sets the standards as to what type of dancing is allowed and what type of dancing is not allowed? The Bible definitely doesn't. Because God says you should worship him in spirit, not in the flesh. If God wanted us to worship him by dancing, he would set out certain rules as to how we can dance before him. So what happens if my, my profession is, is, you know, I'm a dancer. And then I just do you know, all the crumping and the hip-hop dance moves. Don't, don't, don't even tempt me to break them right here, okay? You guys, you, you guys will be very shocked, okay? If you want me to start doing all those things, I can do it, but I won't. <laughs> but um, what happens if someone walks through the door, he, he, he's used to dancing in a nightclub? or she's used to dancing in the nightclub. And then she comes in here and she starts doing those exact dance moves in here. How how are you going to stop her if we said that you can dance to worship God? Definitely, I hope we all agree that that is ungodly. If someone's going to come, especially on the lady's side, and start shaking herself here before everyone, we do agree that that's ungodly. How are you going to stop her because dancing is allowed? Who sets the standards? God would not be that confusing. Dancing does not worship God. And, and, and you know, we could go on and on with this. Of course, I, I won't. But you have to also look at the type of music that is played in churches that makes people feel like they want to dance in that way. The music as well, you can't take a beat from a rap song or from a house song and then just say Jesus a lot and that makes it gospel. That is not, that is not godly music. That is music that excites the flesh and what excites the flesh does not excite the spirit. You can go read Galatians chapter 5. The, the flesh and the spirit are contrary to each other. They are like opposite poles. Things that excite the flesh do not excite the spirit. Things that excite the spirit do not excite the flesh. But of course I said the things that I'll say today are controversial, but it's the truth. 
You cannot worship a God that is convenient for you. Do you know that there are people who won't come to a church like this because we don't dance? There are people who won't come to a church like this because we don't have drums and, and you know, all the instruments that are needed to make a house or a hip-hop track. There are people who won't come to this church because of the way that we pray. Once again, another way in which people worship a convenient God. And I'm not kidding with you. This is something that I have heard with my own ears. The problem here is we are too soft with the way that we pray. Do you hear Bandida, the way he was praying here? Oh, Father, thank you for all the things that you have done for us. Thank you for the hymns. That's too soft, man. I need a church where it will say, fire, turn it back. The arrows should go back to the sender. Yes, fire. You must be more violent and vicious with the way you pray. You know, we're fighting demons here. You need to be able to fight back. I'm not kidding with you. I've heard that with my own ears. There are people who would have come here before and didn't come back because we pray too soft. Are you worshipping a convenient God? Jesus Christ prayed in the Bible many times. Go and observe the way Jesus Christ prayed. Yeah. Did Jesus Christ pray? And, and, and even, let's start with this. What is a prayer? When you're praying, you're communicating with God, not with demons. Yeah. So why then do we need to talk to demons and tell them to get away from us? When I pray, I'm talking to God. And I don't talk to my mom or my dad with that vicious tone. So why would I talk to God like that? Are you worshipping a convenient God? Yes, here's a, a third way and the last way which we'll look at today. Of course, there are many ways in which people make a convenient God. But here's, here's a third way. <clears throat> people make a convenient God that they can obey when it is convenient for them. They, 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 they make up this God that they, they will only obey when it's convenient for them, in the sense that in the Word of God, there are all um, these uh, commandments... And people will pick and choose the ones that they want to obey and the ones they don't want to obey. And then they'll create a God that is, that, that is convenient for them and that they'll obey God in the commandments that are convenient. Oh, I, I will do this, but I won't do that. And there's always, there's always an excuse. There's always an explanation as to why we won't obey that. One I heard recently, in fact, just yesterday from one of the brethren here is that there are some people who don't obey certain things because, oh, that was Paul's thoughts. That was just what Paul was thinking. That's not the Word of God. Yet it's in the Word of God. If, if we'll take out certain verses and cancel them out and rule them out to be just, oh no, that was just Paul's thoughts, we don't need to obey that, then let's take out all the books that were written by Paul. Let's not create a God that is convenient for us, that we will only obey the stuff that we want to obey, the stuff which are convenient for us, and then rule out the rest. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke, Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, I'd like to read verse 37. I'll read from verse 37. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm just trying to find my place here. Okay. And as he spake, certain Pharisees besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisees saw it, he marveled, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and, pla and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without 
make that which is within also. But rather give alms, but rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and 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 root, uh, sorry, mint and root, rue, sorry, and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgments and love of God and the love of God. These ought ye have done, and not to leave the other undone. So I want us to focus mostly on verse 40, 42 there. But what's happening here is uh, a Pharisee called Jesus Christ to have a meal with him. And uh, Jesus Christ started eating without washing his hands. Of which the Jews believe that if you eat food without washing your hands, it makes you unclean. Not unclean in the sense that you get bacteria in your, in your body, but unclean even spiritually. That, that's what they believe. So when, when Jesus Christ started eating and he hadn't washed his hands, this Pharisee, well, he marveled at that. He almost starts to say, how could you do that? You know, you, you're making yourself unclean. And Jesus Christ starts going after him. And he, and he says, you know, the problem with you, this is the, the, the essence of what you are saying, is that you guys make the outside so clean, but on the inside your hearts are wicked. And he has said that he he said this uh, this is something which I believe Jesus Christ would do on purpose just to create that teachable moment because this has happened uh, also um, uh, in, in uh, well another gospel writes about this as well and Jesus Christ told them that it, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man what defiles a man is what comes out from the heart so for you to eat with unwashed hands, that's not going to make you unclean spiritually. What makes you unclean spiritually is what comes out from your heart, which is sin. That's what makes you, that's what defiles you. So here he's trying to tell this man that you, you guys are so concerned about making the outside clean, but on the inside you're wicked. He says that what you guys do, go and read those verses. Okay, I didn't read them well, but go read them again and, and understand what Jesus Christ was saying there. He also says that you guys give, you, you give all these alms and, and all of that, and then you consider everything else clean. That is not the case. He says that you give, you know, of, of all these herbs and you give this and that, yet you, you ignore the judgments and the love of God. He says that you, you should have done this. It's good that you give tithes and all of that. But don't do this and then leave the other stuff undone. Don't, don't create a God that is convenient for you. Because this is the mentality that I believe some of the Pharisees have. And some people have this mentality today as well. That okay, God, I'll give you tithes. Uh, I'll give you my hour on Sunday. And then let me live the rest of my life. I've given you what you asked for. Now just close your eyes as I sin from Monday to Saturday. That's a God that's convenient for you. You, you can't pick and choose what you want to obey. Yes, it's good for you to come to church. If you have been saved and you're part of a church, it's good for you to pay tithe. But you don't do that at the expense of everything else and leave everything else undone. God wants you to obey him in everything. Don't worship a God uh, who is convenient for you. Worship the almighty God as he is and as he wants you to worship him. In, in conclusion, um, I'd like for us to look at Mark, Mark chapter 5 very quickly. In Mark chapter 5, this is a, a story which is very familiar, but I'd like to pull out a, a, a certain um, lesson from this. In Mark chapter 5, we'll start reading from verse 22. <clears throat> I'll try to read this quickly. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at, a point of, at the point of death. 
I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and, sh and, shall, and she shall live. Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather wor grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garments. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she, had, that she was healed of that plague. Jesus, immediately knowing in him that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched me? Who touched my clothes? Sorry. Verse 31. And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now, I just wanted to conclude with this story. Of course, we could have a whole hour's worth of lesson from this story alone. So I'll just brush through it. I just, it's just one thing I'd like for us to learn from here, uh, from, from this scripture. Here, here, here's, here's this lady. She had an issue of blood. And she had gone to all these physicians. And nothing, well, God, nothing, not, no one helped her. Things didn't get better, but rather they grew worse. But when she went to Jesus Christ, she said, all I want is to touch his clothes and I'll be healed. And she went there and she touched Jesus' clothes. And, and, and when she touched Jesus' clothes, there are so many people around her thronging him. He's in a multitude and there are a lot of people thronging him, rubbing against him. This is Jesus Christ. But when this woman touched him, virtue came out of him. Virtue means moral goodness. Moral goodness came out of him and he knew it. Not only did Jesus know it, but the woman who touched him also knew. And then when Jesus said, who touched me? His disciples probably thinking, what's wrong with Jesus? Has he gone crazy? There are so many people touching him in this multitude and he's saying, who touched me? Now after like 10, 15 people or maybe hundreds of people have touched him. And then Jesus looks around and he sees this woman. So what, what would, I, I, what would I, I like to point out, to highlight from this, is that there are many people in this world that touch Jesus, that throng him, that maybe call out for the name of Jesus Christ. But it's of no effect. Why is it? Or do you think all the people in the multitude had all the virtue they needed? No. They were, a lot of them were probably sinners. Well, they were all sinners. But what I mean is probably the only saved people there were the disciples. All these people needed to be saved. A lot of these people probably had a plague too. Why is it that when they thronged Jesus Christ, they didn't get healed? What difference did this woman have? That in this multitude of people that were thronging Jesus Christ, when she went and touched his clothes, it made a difference. Well, the difference is that she approached Jesus Christ in faith. The way which Jesus Christ expected people to come to him. So even in this world, a lot of people are touching Jesus Christ. A lot of people say they are Christians. A lot of people say that they are worshipping the Lord. But if you are worshipping a convenient God, you are just like that multitude that's just thronging Jesus Christ and is not making a difference. But if you choose to come worship the Almighty God in the time that He requires you to worship Him, which is now, in the way in which he requires you to worship him, which is in spirit and in truth, in the way in which he wants you to obey him, which is complete obedience, 
when you touch Jesus Christ, it will make a difference in your life. And you will know it, and Jesus will know it. Let's close eyes and pray. Thank you, Father, for what you have taught us today. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. Lord, um, we, we, we are guilty of this. We are guilty of creating a convenient God that we will only worship when it's convenient for us, in a way that's convenient for us, and obey only the commandments that are convenient for us. But I pray, Father, that you may keep these words in, in, in our hearts. May we worship you. May we remember that we were created for you, not you for us. I pray, Father, that everyone that is here may forsake any idol, any God that they've created for themselves and choose to come and worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray these things, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.